single deployment separation, which is similar to the uh, the recovery system that we had implemented last year. Unfortunately, our rocket last year, Intrepid, had suffered a shred during boost. Uh, but we're returning at the with the same recovery method, which is a piston deployment system that is going to separate the rocket um, and then revealing a reefed parachute with basically a custom line cutter system uh, to disreef the parachute into main deployment at a specific main altitude. Um, and then, so breaking down the systems we have, or the location of the systems in the rocket, we have GPS tracking and a custom avionics flight recorder up in the nose cone. Uh, we have the payload system uh, that is in the nose cone coupler below that. The parachute is gonna be in a recovery bay just below that coupler. Uh, then further below that in the aft coupler, we have the piston deployment system pointing upwards into the recovery bay, uh, which is controlled by two redundant ROC3 computers. Um, and then below that is the booster containing the motor with three fins that are a swept clip delta shape. Uh, and the booster is made up of two tubes that are coupled together. Uh, the coupler is a permanent connection using a, lots of epoxy. So uh, do you have any questions over the general layout of the rocket? No, it looks pretty straightforward to me. Uh, well, I, I will want to come back and look at your fence and stuff, um, but let's, you know, go ahead and go ahead. Since yep. you shredded well, last year, um, can you give me an idea of what you did different here to prevent that? Uh, so this year, we'll go into a little bit more detail about it too with our AV, with our aero structures lead, who is overseeing the, or oversaw all the manufacturing of the custom body tubes. Okay, uh, but main main two differences to kind of keep it brief is a extra layer added on each tube that we wind custom in house. Um, also, looking into specific winding angles uh, last year, we kept it at exactly 45 degrees for each layer. Um, and then this year we have a kind of variety of those orientations. So uh, I believe it's 35 degrees two forty fives, and then 70. So we did a little bit more. Uh, a lot more analysis into our tube structuring and then also our couplers as well, making to ex taking extra precautions into making sure that our couplers fit much more snugly into the tubes. Uh, that is something that we are cautious about from last year is making sure that everything it has a nice tight connection, even expanding upon um, a higher than one body caliber connection on uh, the recovery coupler. In addition, last year, we also had a uh, much longer rocket. Uh, so this year we shrank down the overall length of the vehicle. Um, we experienced some stability problems last year, and we believe that led to uh, contributing to the shred as well. Okay. Yep. Uh, let's see. So, uh, with that on open rocket simulation, we're looking at a predicted apogee of about 30,200 feet, uh, reaching a velocity of Mach 1.7 at 23 G's off the pad. Uh, the O5500, without a better way to put it, is a pretty aggressive burning motor. So, we're going to be seeing a lot of velocity right off the rail. Uh, our exit velocity is at 146 feet per second. Uh, here's kind of some more of the technical data there from Open Rocket Sim. Okay. Um, did you do a RAS Aero Sims? Yes, we also have RAS, RAS Aero Sims. Uh, yeah. Kind of the mentality that we approached with on the high level design of the vehicle this year was primarily using Open Rocket as kind of a Building simulator building mm -hmm. software while RAS Aero has been our primary simulation software. Perfect. That's that's the way to do it. Yep. And then also just to kind of throw out the graph here of our flight path. Um, if this will open oh, we go plot, sorry. So just to give the graph here of uh the altitude, velocity, and acceleration of the rocket. Um and I'll also pull up the Brass Aero Sims as well here in just a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. 
I'm more interested in the Raz Zero sense than I am. Yeah, but I, I agree sense. with you. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and I agree with you. The Open Rockets is a great simple CAD program. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. with sub below box emissions are are fairly decent. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you get into the realm that you're talking about, it kind of you know you really need to be looking at Raz Zero. So yeah, I'm glad to get out. Okay. Yep. Uh, so once again, layout of the vehicle in RAS Aero. Uh, we just have all the exact same dimensions of the external vehicle here mm -hmm. in RAS Aero with the nose cone, uh, recovery tube, and the booster. Uh, let's see. Is there anything you want to see in particular, or just go straight into the? Yeah, front I'm, I'm curious what the difference is in projected altitudes and velocities. Uh, uh, uh yeah. In RAS Aero versus open rockets. Uh, <laughs> not much. Aero, yeah. <laughs> We're seeing possibly slightly higher altitude, but that's going to be heavily dependent on the wind speeds and temperature of that day. Um, True. And on top of that, too, I mean, that doesn't exactly account for like tube fasteners, any sort of small just differences on the airframe as well. So that's something we are acknowledging as we go through this. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just go ahead and pull up the simulation here. Um, so, yeah, here we have our yeah. altitude plot. Um, once again, I mean, it's, it's not entirely different from open rocket, but it does have some minor details. Um, and then it does also vary too, depending on if you're using like turbulent flow assumption or like maybe modified bar or the modified barrowman equations. Yes. Uh, and it does. So, yeah, it will also, also, also vary depending on what kind of a, um. Kind of a paint job be picked too, but whether yeah. you have it it's painted or naked or whatever. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this year we're doing don't... a vinyl wrap. Um, oh, okay, we'll have that done here in another week or so. Uh, let's see. So um, I guess we could go into velocity first, uh, reaching about two thousand feet per second. That's fairly close to what we saw in open rockets. So that should be that Mach one point seven. I, or high Mach 1.7 right uh, here. So I'll get the full point values. Yep. So reaching max speed of about 1.74 Mach. Okay. All right. So the yeah, the other question. This is going to be more for the air for the air structures people is, you know, heavy compression testing and all that sort of stuff. So yep. This is good. I understand it. Um, you you develop the way I do. <laughs> yep. So from that perspective, uh, I think we're we're good. Okay. Um, yeah. I say we'll be interested in understanding what's changed and and how we think we can make it through this time. So yeah. Um, okay. So what we'll, we'll kind of how we're gonna how we're planning on doing this is just having each of the team leads that were just introduced. They're gonna give kind of a quick description of uh, their physical system that they have here uh, here on camera. Uh, we do have the airframe sitting behind us, so we have a cell phone that we're going to use to just kind of walk around and do do a walk around of the vehicle with that. Uh, okay. so we'll start off with aerostructures with Milena here, um, and we'll just let her kind of do a quick run through of all the external components of the vehicle. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Do you want to mute on your phone or on my phone? Here, here. Would you like to? Introduce yourself, Melina. All right. So, as I said earlier, um, I'm Melina. I am the aerostructures team lead. Uh, so, starting with the nose cone, as soon as he gets that pulled up. Uh, but the nose cone is all made from fiberglass. It's nine layers. Uh, we make it in a female mold and uh, lay up each side, and then we put the mold together and then let it cure. Hey, you got it? Or... Okay, yeah, there, there's a nose cone. Uh, we're still working on post processing it, but it's oh, getting close to done. Uh, moving down, uh, then we have the payload coupler, which is the forward coupler. Um, all of our couplers are eight layers of carbon fiber. Uh, these are also made in a female mold uh, that's put together, and then we lay up inside the mold. Um, and then moving to the tubes, uh, we have the recovery tube. Uh, all of our tubes are made in house uh, that we filament wind. 
So the pattern we use is a hoop wind on our base, and then it's a 35, two 45s, and a 70 on top just to give us a nice finish. Uh, so that's how we make the recovery tube and the booster tube. Uh, those are both made on our X winder that we do have in house. Um, and then the booster tube is made from two separate tubes that we join together with an internal coupler and all of the epoxy. So that joint is permanently there. And then the last part is the fins. Um, these are made from a fiberglass uh, core, uh, sandwich panels, two layers of carbon fiber on each side. And then we attach them to the rocket with JB Weld fillets. And then over the top of that, we do a tip to tip. It's three layers of carbon fiber, um, alternating layers of plain weave, and then a biaxial weave layer in the middle. And then we finish the fins with aluminum fin edging. So that's kind of an okay. overview of these systems. Okay. Do you, have you compression tested these tubes? Yeah, we did a lot of testing at the beginning of this year. Uh, we did, tested different wind angles and stuff. Uh, we maxed out the machine in our lab that we have access to. Uh, the tubes either never broke or they just delaminated at the top when they hit at least uh, thirty thousand kilo no thirty kilonewtons, and some of them just completely maxed out the machine. <clears throat> okay. And All right. uh, he's got right some of the, We have some examples yeah. of those Instron tested tubes right here. Yeah, so. Yeah, this is one of our tubes. Um, we tested this one and it never broke. We maxed out the machine at like 40 kilonewtons. And then this one, uh, I don't know how you can see it, but this one just delammed at about, yeah. Yeah, could you, could you do me a favor and close out the simulation so I can see? Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, get, get, get back to full screen. There we, there we go. That's better. Yeah, so uh, our tube, a lot of our tubes also look like the DLAM. Uh, these happen about 30 kilonewtons, and the tubes themselves actually never broke. They, the tops just delaminated and just kind of squished down. And that's the worst damage we had to our tubes. Okay. Um, how thick are tubes? Um, it's five layers thick. Um, I think they're the thickness is like they're about seventy to eighty now. Yeah. So seventy to eighty thousands. Okay, and your couplers? And the couplers are um uh, they should be about the same. Yeah, because the couplers are also uh eight layers, so Okay. And can you cycle? Okay. Um, so this thing. Okay. So what's the length of the what's the length of the couplers? Um, one of them is uh. 16, so the recovery coupler is sixteen, and the payload coupler. So yeah, the recovery coupler in the center of the rocket that is sixteen inches long. And the payload coupler up towards the nose cone above the recovery tube, that is uh, 14 inches long with a four inch switch band on it. So the, it's, uh, the payload coupler six has six one, six. excuse me? So your switch bands are four inches? Uh, on the, sorry, on the recovery coupler uh, below the recovery tube, the switch band on that is three inches, so we have six and a half inches of uh, kind of jointing material there. Okay, um, so you have six and a half inches that's going inside too. Yep, that's correct. Okay, all right. Okay, and yep, so it's it's above a caliber. I, I believe it's like one point two five. It's like one and a quarter calibers of length. Okay, all right. Um. Okay, how can you tell me how these are going to be mated together? That is where your sure pins are, where hard points are um, for couples tubes together. Yes, so on the aft end of the recovery tube, that is not going to be a separation point. So the aft end is okay. going to be the end of the booster. Uh, that will be retained with six. Uh, six thirty second screws on the Apogee tube fasteners that are available, uh, or those like aluminum Apogee tube fasteners, uh, which are 
those like kind of nut or like threaded nuts that you can install into your uh, airframe. Okay. And then I'm not the, familiar with them, but that's okay. And then the um, forward connection, which is the separation point for deployment, is going to be retained with three six thirty second nylon shear pins. Uh, I believe off the top of my head that equates to about like 350 maximum pounds of force required to break all three of those connections. Okay. Um, have you ground, have you ground tested yet? Uh, so we have not ground tested this vehicle in particular. However, the piston system itself that separates the vehicle. Uh, that has flown on a separate five inch test vehicle that we have made over the year. Um, so that is that has flown four separate times uh, this year and as well as last year too. Um, a slightly modified version of it that we had flown last year flew three times. Um, so we, we've both ground tested and flight tested the system just on a separate vehicle in a very in like the exact same configuration. Do you plan on testing the current the, the contest vehicle if you go to the it's contest? We, we plan on testing it hopefully this week or possibly this weekend. Okay. All right. Um, can we see the rocket again? That's yeah. disappeared on me. Yeah, the the video up. Yep, there it is. Yep, so that's the vehicle all kind of separated laid out there. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, can I see that nose cone again? Okay. Um, all right. That's hard to tell from here, but that's okay. All right. Yeah, and the okay. nose cone itself has a like, um, it's a seven inch shoulder on it to uh, that has room to like combine or um, join with the forward coupler there. Okay. All right, well, that's what the threaded rod sticking out is all. Uh, so the threaded rod there is for the mounting point of our custom avionics flight recording system. So they're going to be taking data from the flight, uh, hopefully to use it for future control systems. Uh, so they're currently working on developing a controller. Okay. All right. Um, let's go down a little bit on the rocket. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So you got aluminum bulk plates, bulkheads. Yes. Every connection, every coupler connection has uh, aluminum bulk plates. The forward coupler has two three eighths th in inch thick bulk plates made of uh, custom aluminum, or like aluminum that we machined in house. Uh, okay. The Piston has its own bulkheads for the recovery coupler. They're built into the system. So those are acting as the bulk plates there on that coupler. Okay. I also slow down, slow down. Yeah. You want to just kind of slow down as you're just kind of like a slow pan. As you're going. Yeah, he's fine. Just letting let him sit right where he's at for right now. Okay. So that's closed eye bolts. So that's good. All right. Yep. Yeah. Um, while we're here, describe how this thing's going to work for me. And, for I, the, and, and, if, and, and if, if there's somebody else that needs to do it, that's fine. Yep. I don't interrupt, but you know, as it, it, the, the flow is, is working out pretty good. So I don't know if that's how you had it planned or not, but yeah. Either way uh, it works. So I'm going to bring in our mechanical team lead who, uh, developed this system and, uh, had a huge part in manufacturing it as well. This is uh, Joshua Hediger, so he's going to go into a little bit more detail about how the system functions um, as we have the video here, too. Cool. Uh, so okay, cool. The system has two charges, a primary and redundant charge. It is attached, so the charges are created like this. It has an aluminum cap with a rubber gasket to hold pressure, and then it, the canister is right here, and then it, it screws in with half inch 20 threads with Teflon tape to ensure a tight seal. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, keep going. Oh, sorry. Okay. So then we load the black powder and using, we put it in, a, we make um, the charges, we put them in those canisters. Once those can, at, um, whenever we want drogue to deploy, the first charge will go off. And then I think it's 
plus three, the redundant charge will go off. These charges are separated and they have two separate RRC threes um, that deploy them with two separate power sources so that the, there is the redundancy there. Okay. Once those charges fire, the shaft will push up against the um, top cap and there's an O-ring in there to keep that sealed. So there's a lot of, there's three O-rings total in there. There's one on the shaft, there's one on the top and one on the bottom where the uh, canister goes into those two, uh, the center and the top cap bulkhead to hold that pressure in. And that has been hydrostatic tested to over 1400 PSI to hold that before the, the failing point right now, or the failing point was those rubber gaskets. But that was due to their poor design and manufacture. We've since improved that. Um, but once, yeah, once the shaft goes up, it will push. There is an eye bolt and a piston head on the shaft that will push against an internal switch band. And what will that do? It will push against the internal switch band. It will shear the three shear pins or whatever and separate that rocket at that point. Hey, um, have you mounted this in your current system, the one you're taking to the contest? Have yeah. you, you have you tested it in the current system um, that you're going to be only, that you're going to take to the contest? I guess I guess you know it's great, and I like what I see. But my, my first question is, you know, is the piston going to get stuck? Mm -hmm. Uh, how time, yeah, what, how, your your tolerances on your homemade tubes may not necessarily be the same tolerances that are on a manufactured tube. And you you see what I'm saying? You see where I'm headed? Yeah, and we actually on the flight vehicle that we tested this system on um, over the course of the past semester, that was made in the recovery section and coupler connection. So the same connection that is interfacing on the cup rocket. That those are made with the same manufacturing methods um, in house, just like the cup rocket. So those are custom made too. That's a custom made recovery tube and a custom made coupler for this piston system. Uh, that was flown four times in this semester in just this semester alone. Um, Successfully separated. But yeah, uh, we are planning on testing the system in this vehicle. Hopefully this weekend, we're just waiting for approval on firing the system um, and having the vehicle ready to go for that. So hopefully with it by tomorrow or Sunday, uh, we're going to be doing a static test fire of that. Okay. All right. Yeah, please, please do that because, you know, pistons can get jammed, pistons, you know, all that kind of good stuff goes on. So, yeah, um, the, the fact that you're going to test it makes me feel like on that end of it. So. Yeah, okay. and as we mentioned too, even uh, we've even hydrostat. So we've just the system alone outside of the cup vehicle. Uh, I mean, it's been hydrostatic tested. It has been ground tested multiple times over inside of the testing vehicle, and then it is also flown in that same testing vehicle. And the the cocking uh, was a concern that we had last year um, with the original design of this piston system for our cup rocket last year. Uh, so we extensively tested that uh, last year um, on our cup rocket, and we did not experience uh, any separation failure due to cocking. Um, so this year we performed those same tests with our test vehicle and continued to not experience any issues due to cocking for separation. Okay. Did you get separation last year? You said you... You, you basically you said your your rocket came apart last year. So, so yeah, I mean it, it uh, unfortunately shredded during boost. So um, it it separated when we weren't intending it to due to the uh, basically the airframe itself had kind of sheared at a uh, at the point of the recovery tube on the rocket. Um, watching kind of analyzing the, the results of the launch from last year. We noticed that the rocket had a concerning amount of basically bending happening or like kind of a wiggling effect as it went through flight. Um, it just kind of got to a point where you basically had a rocket that was shaped more like a, a C or a banana as it was flying in the air. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, it just completely just snapped in half. Okay. Okay. That, that, and I've been there too. So <laughs> I, know, I know the feeling. All right. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Now let's do. Uh, let's talk about the electronics bay then. The, the, or, uh, so you... for the recovery system, is that yes? What you're referring to? Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're for the recovery system. Do you want to get your camera out, even though we don't have it on there? I'll just show you where it's at. Um, so that's going to be mounted directly below the piston on the threaded rods that are connected to that system. So if you want to just point that out with your hands, Mitch, just where that system is going, we have a fiberglass sled that will be mounting right there. Uh, and that's going to be mounted with two of these RRC3 computers uh, from okay. uh, mm -hmm. each on their own redundant 9 volt power supply, uh, and then powered on with two uh, independent key switches. Okay, but you don't, you can't show me that, right? You don't, you have not completed that yet? Uh, we have everything except for the fiberglass component of the sled. Uh, so we have two aluminum mounting plates that are finished. Uh, they're sitting in this building. Do you have those with you? Yeah. Uh, so we have the mounting plates. We just don't have the two fiberglass sleds. Uh, we have the stock here. It's just a matter of getting the two squares cut out. And uh, hopefully that is going to be completed either today or tomorrow. Okay. How are you going to secure your battery? The batteries are going to be secured with two of the nine volt holders. Uh, we have, do you have the nine volt holders out by chance, Luke? Uh, I have a board with them on it. Or like a mount. Yeah. Do you want to get that? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, here we go. So yeah, we have two of these nine volt holders uh, that we've heavily utilized on a majority of our vehicles. Uh, using these plus lots of zip ties and tape to secure the nine volts in place. Uh, we have yet to have ever experienced a failure with our nine volts, uh, fortunately, but yeah, at the moment, that's how we've been retaining our nine volts. Okay, that's fine. How, how, are, you the, how are your zip ties going to be? Can you just... Yeah, usually there is a hole placed on either side or multiple holes placed on either side of the sled where the zip ties slide through and around the entire holder, mounting them directly to the sled. Um, and then, the, yeah, this is one of those aluminum mounting plates that we have here that just mount directly to the threaded rod. And there's going to be two screw holes there on either side to hold that sled in place. Like that. Show the zip ties. Yeah. The zip ties around the battery. Here we've got an example of a sled okay. that was 3D printed for our test rocket. Um, this one is 3D printing is acceptable for this because the test rocket uh, flew on a lot smaller motor. Um, so as you can, if you can kind of see, these zip ties go all the way through the 3D print. Um, they're just drilled holes through um, mm -hmm. that allow us to run the zip ties through. Okay. Um, right, right back. Um, where's your RRC3? What wires? Is that the battery wires that are going in? Uh, on the yeah, top. Yes. Hold on. This is, this is not going to be flying on our cup rod. This is, I know this is that. an example of I know the that. Pull on the wires for me. Okay. I'm sorry, but yeah. I can guarantee when you go to New Mexico. Oh yeah, without you, you'll tear your electronics bay apart, and they were pulling on wires. Yep, yep. Okay, we, so, we love doing our tug tests. Yep, good. Okay, perfect. Very good. And for switches, are you still? Uh, if I remember right, you were going to be using the magnetic switches, or have you switched around? Or uh, so for the magnetic switches, we're relying on those for the custom avionics flight recorders and the payload device as well. For the actual recovery electronics, we're going with key switches to keep it as much of a mechanical system as possible and prevent any you know weird failures from a magnetic switch. Uh, yeah. We used magnetic switches on our recovery devices last year, and we did have some issues with being able to turn them on. And it was kind of a, yeah, it was kind of a headache with that. But we had an issue where the, the magnetic switches were, since you have to mount them so close to the carbon fiber tubes, um, as we were integrating the couplers, um, some of that carbon fiber dust uh, scraped uh -huh. off the couplers onto the magnetic switches and activated those. Um, we solved that issue using some electrical tape over it to prevent that carbon fiber dust. 
Um, it didn't get in the way of the operation of the magnetic switches, um, other than protecting it from the carbon fiber. Um, we're using the magnetic switches for the, the, as Kyle said, the custom avionics in the, uh, in the nose cone. Um, we like the magnetic switches for that because we're able to mount the magnet to the end of a dowel um, and smack the, smack the magnet target with the, the, the activation magnet. Um, which reduces our dependency on having ladders at the, uh, at the rail. Okay. That's great. Um, okay. Let's see here. Okay. Let's talk about recovery. Okay. Um, and I guess you're going to do, uh, well, we, yeah, wait, let's talk about how you can do your, your, your recovery. Yep. So just to give a quick summary as Cooper is going to take over here, uh, he's our recovery lead this year. Uh, we are doing a kind of custom shoot release, custom like line cutter sort of method for the the main deployment of the rocket. Um, nominally, whenever the piston fires at Apogee, releasing the shoot from the recovery bay, it'll be in a uh, kind of was it drogue or like reefed configuration, yeah, to be reefed. A, a drogue effect. So here's Cooper here. He's our recovery lead, and he's going to go into a little more detail about that. Okay. All right. What? Okay. So for the parachute, um, we are going to be doing a nine and a half foot iris. Um, we want with the iris to get a higher drag coefficient um, to maximize or minimize volume of the parachute. Um, so this is the okay. one. This is the shoot that we use for all of our test flights. Yeah, you're. Oh, there. sorry. There. And the part I want to show you here is. Let's just have that laid out and we can do the hmm? video on the phone. Oh, sure. But we have, we have pouches, uh, three pouches around the chute um, with holes on either side and a zipper on top of the pouch. And that's where our 3D printed um, reefing devices go in. So those reefing devices are what holds our reefing computers, batteries, and switches. So you can see the two holes there. Uh, are where the reefing line will go through. And so that's going to be a 150 pound nylon cord. Um, and that will be cut by the uh, line cutters, pyrotechnic line cutters. And those will also be shown. You don't have to bring that one over. That was just for the strata logger. Okay. Here, I can, if you want to give me that though. He needs yeah, that. I bet she needs that. Thank you. So we just got our, I've been printing in PLA, but for the heat in the desert, I'm going to use BTG. So we just got that in. So I don't have the final printed boxes yet, but what those will look like is, I, I wasn't showing it, but that will be um, the computers and the batteries and the switch will all be screwed in there. Um, and then the lid will go on top to secure everything. So the line cutter cannot come out by any way because um, the lid will hold a tight fit for that. Uh, but that's where we get into our SRAT electronics. So we have our reefy computer, if you want to show that. Um, how that works is you've got a single pyro channel on there as well as a barometer and a light sensor. So once that is activated on the pad, it will start looking for light. And so once the parachute comes out of its parachute bag, when it's deployed by the piston, it will see light and it will start looking for altitude via the barometric altimeter. Um, so our disc reef altitude will be at 1500 feet. And that's when our main parachute goes from a drogue to a main. So our calculated, calculated descent rate for the reef chute will be about 70 feet per second. And then with the main fully deployed, will be 22 and a half feet per second. And so what we have triple redundancy, we've got, you can see that's, that's the reefing, the custom reefing computer right there. We've got the terminal blocks to secure both the um, pyro igniter that goes inside that metal line cutter right there, as well as the two leads to the battery. Um, so that's what the terminal block is for. We'll be using two of those, as well as a strata logger CF, that is our COTS backup. Um, and then to activate all of that, we've got, we've got wireless switches. So how that works is we've got a little 
little activation device and then the actual switch itself that will be plugged in initially um, but won't send power until activated by the activation device on the pad so that has two redundant uh, current channels solid state so we don't have to worry about g-forces there we'll press the button to activate that and it will turn the computers on but the computers will also be able to send a signal back and say hey we've got power we've got continuity we're all our sensors are initialized good to go just so we get that data back on the pad before we launch um though computers are all running on lithium ion batteries in the metal casing there's going to be two wired in series um and you can see these uh these are cots uh battery holders right there and those will be held in by screws inside of the reefing device um and then for the wireless activation device that will be rf it will be low power it's 915 megahertz um it is an encrypted signal as well as it's looking for a specific password string even on that encrypted signal just to make sure nothing else interferes with that at all um so that is the over oh Oh, oh, you're muted if you're trying to say something. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> he was right on that. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was muting our dogs, barking incessantly. Um, make sure I understand things correctly. Um, your reefing device has two electronic devices. Uh, one's a strata logger, the other one is your SRAD device. We've got two SRAD and then one COTS uh, strata logger, yes. One cost strata longer and okay. All right. So you got do have redundancy on your main, that's good. Um I you know at this stage of the game, um it's pretty cool. Um I guess I hope get to see it work. <laughs> have you actually flown it? We have, have, have you actually flown it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um and it, it, it's in you actually flown this or not or yes we did fly this hmm. okay did it work it did work okay all right well that's that's all we need okay and then the parachute is the iris is the one that, that you've used before or um, is this it... one is, we are manufacturing um using the same manufacturing techniques we used last year Unfortunately, uh, our parachute went through some unexpected stress tests last year when it shredded around Mach 1. Yeah. <laughs> the ripstop yeah. nylon actually shredded before any of the stitches broke. So that's all we can really ask for. Okay. So but you're basically going to new shoot then, is what it boils down to. Yes. Okay. What is the length of your shock cord lines or your, uh, yeah, your shock, what's called the shock cord? It's, 45 feet, um, that's gonna be tubular nylon, one inch wide, 4,000 pounds strength, um, as well as on there, we've got quick links all above 1,000 pounds strength with a 5,000 pound swivel right there. Okay, all right, that definitely works. Um, I can't see any burn marks on any of that stuff, right? That's all clean, new, used. Yep. And even, even so with our piston, our shock shock cords not being anywhere near any heat or anything like that. So, yeah, except when that nose cone comes off and the payload goes flying with it, you've got all that weight, right? So, yeah, it, it'll still be stretched. It'll, it'll still be stretched. Oh, yes, it'll most definitely be stressed. Um, just hopefully not by fire. But actually, again, this is the same shock cord we used last year when we did shred. The motor was still burning. Um, and the shock cord went directly into the line of the motor burning and was still fine. Obviously, we're not using that same shock cord. It's, it's the same brand, but it's same brand. using the same stuff. <laughs> yeah. Same material. <laughs> same brand. Gotcha. Fresh gotcha. shock cord gotcha. that's never flown before, but same brand that was stress tested last year. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. I assume you're going to do some sort of um, Z fold or something like that with the with the shock cord. Yes. Uh, yep. With tape or whatever. Okay. Yep. All with right. our, our blue tape. That's the method we've used for all of our test flights and it's worked well. Yeah. 
yeah, whatever, you know, I, rubber bands, blue tape, masking tape, you, you know, it runs the gamut. Just don't do something that would prevent it from like good old fashioned duct tape or something like that. So, okay, um, that sounds good to me. Um, can we go back? You, you, re recovery is good as long as everything works and fingers crossed. I hope it does. Um, the can we go back and talk about the rail buttons or however you're going to ish with the rail? Yep. Um, and also, real quick, uh, just to make a quick note, our um, flyer of record here, uh, he does have to be leaving soon. Um, is there anything that you'd like to discuss with him or um, that you need from him? No. Nope. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> He just needs to bring his. He, all you guys need to bring your trophy cards and all that good stuff. So, okay, you know, yep, that sounds good. I, I mean, I would prefer a uh, level three to have probably a little more experience, <laughs> but yeah. there's not much I can do about that. So, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, um, getting back to your but, question about the rail buttons. Um, so as of right now, uh, do you have the video on there, Mitch? Oh, okay, okay, got it. So as of right now, they're not fully installed yet. They're just sitting um, in place where they're going to be installed. Uh, they're going to be retained with, uh, I mean, I, I, you're probably familiar with the fashion of rail button like that. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. quarter 20 screw or like quarter 20, yeah, quarter 20 countersunk screw into the airframe. And then it's going to be retained with a T-nut on each of those connections. Uh, the cool. T-nut itself will be epoxyed in um, and permanently positioned in place. Okay. And then we'll likely be putting like Loctite or something once we're actually, especially on the aft rail button, we'll likely use some Loctite or something to make sure nothing's coming out. That That's a good good thing to do. Can we go back to the, the aft end, the motor end, and we got a thrust plate? Uh, yes, we do. So that's sitting on the ground there. Uh, it's retained with, uh, let's see, how many screws is that thrust plate? Uh, air, uh, air. So we have our propulsion guy. Uh, he's overseeing the motor retainment in the rocket as well as uh, the okay. motor. So he oversaw the motor selection. Um, and he has a little bit to say about that. And then just kind of like talk about the yeah retainment or the thrust plate too. So this is Ashton Baker. He's our propulsion lead. Okay. Go for it. Yeah, so uh, this year, uh, at the start of our semester, uh, we had lost our main uh, like propulsion advisor. Uh, so we weren't totally sure if we were going to be able to make SRAT. Unfortunately, we were not, but we were still kind of designing around that if we had the capabilities. But we had the backfall of the O5500 uh, as like our main like COTS motor. We had looked at some other options, but really at the time, from what was available, what we could buy, the O5500X was really the best option. So in terms of retention, we've got a 98 millimeter uh, inner tube to hold it. It's fiberglass. Uh, you can see it sticking out right at the end there. And then there are two 6061 aluminum centering rings in there to hold it in position. Those are epoxied in. We rough the surfaces inside there to make sure that it holds. And then in terms of the actual thrust plate at the, uh, the end there, it has uh, a like 2.47 uh, factor of safety for the actual physical system. And then the factor of safety for the bolts themselves, if it does end up riding on those bolts, uh, it is like unreasonably large. It's like 2000 pounds of shear per uh, 832 bolt. And there are six of those 832 bolts. The O5500X uh, itself has a max thrust of like 1700 pounds so we should not exceed the bolt strength there okay so that just fits into the rear and you're, you're going to bolt that in place yep and then you're going to use the arrow pack to actually retain the motor yes yep <clears throat> all right nice and just to clarify to uh the pre preliminary design of that thrust plate uh it does have a notch there or kind of like a flattened ledge where it's actually transmitting the forces through the airframe. 
So it's not being transferred through the, the bolts, at least intentionally. That's just there as a redundancy and to keep the arrow pack in place. Yep. Gotcha. I figured that's when he put it, that's what it looked like to me. So cool. Okay. What else is left? It does come out of tubes. We've talked uh, we do about have it. the well, we do also yeah. have our payload as well, um, to quickly present and then um just the custom avionics and GPS tracking and the nose cone, as far as I'm aware. And of course, if there's anything you want to see again or anything else you have questions about, we can go over that as well. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I'm really not interested in the payload. I'm only interested in what the safety implications of the payload are. In okay. other words, is it not going to move? Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. Because uh, the payload contest is, is entirely separate. Um, yep. believe it or not. So, so if you can it, uh, show me the payload, so I'll make sure it's not fall apart and then show how me show me how it's mounted within the airframe. Yeah. So that I, I have a very comfortable feeling. It's not going to go flying somewhere. Okay. Um, and, and is the payload be deployed or is it internal? It's internal. It is staying in its place. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because yep. I was going to say, between reef cutters and everything else you got going yeah. on, and you're going to tell me you're going to do a deployable payload. I'm going to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a full plate. Okay. So they're getting that out now uh, to show you with the other camera. Uh, this is Ethan here. Uh, just to kind of give a quick overview, like I said, it's a static payload. Uh, they have their experiment contained within, and then they also do have uh, telemetry broadcasting. So there's a topic that he will be going over as well. Uh, okay. So here's Ethan, our payload lead. Okay. So because we have the payload just on the camera now, the airframe is, or the structure of it is pretty simple. The corners are um, three sixteenths inch steel L brackets, which are bolted together with, um, I believe it's fifteen millimeter aluminum extrusions, and that comprises the main frame. Uh, and then the mount for like the actual experiment are three D printed in PETG. That's just fairly standard as far as payloads go, but the interesting stuff you're going to want to hear about is our radio and our battery. I'll start off with okay. the battery because the radio is going to take a little bit to talk about, but for power sources, we are using these 18650 lithium ion battery cells from Samsung. And our battery configuration is 6 total cells with 3 basically sets of them in series of 2. So, we'll be okay. having a 2S voltage, which is around, I believe. 7.4 nominal volts and then our battery each of these cells has 3.5 amp hours of charge in it and we have six of them so it totals to about 21 amp hours or 21,000 milliamp hours to be able to make sure that our payload will not be running out of power during flight okay. and okay. coming back down because part of what the payload does is recording video of our experiment and that's fairly power intensive as well, uh, another thing that's about the power intensive is our radio transmission. We are using um, five watt LoRa's to transmit uh, telemetry data down to the ground using an antenna placed in the um, radio transparent nose cone. Um, the stats of the radio, it's five watt transmit. We're on the ultra high frequency band. Our connections are addressed and encrypted to ensure that we're not interfering with anyone else's radio stuff. And the radio has a max like bandwidth of 62.5 kilobytes a second. We're coming nowhere near that. We're transmitting packet size of 240 bytes at a maximum rate of two hertz. Okay. My first question to you is, have you documented the radio frequencies and has that information been sent on to Astra and in particular Da Vinci for further so, so they know what's going on. Uh, yes, we have done extensive reading of the DTEG. We've uh, documented what frequencies our radio is using, and we made sure because it is well over the transmit limit requiring a radio review in the DTEG, we are set up for that. However, in the DTEG, it also says that in order to have a radio, in order to be, in order to need a radio review, you need to have um, SRAD fired energetics on your rocket. We do not have SRAD fired energetics, but we want, we are planning to have the radio review just in case. And then to make sure our frequencies are reserved. So we don't have anyone else talking over our telemetry. Very good. That's 
good. And yeah, um, better safe than sorry, because uh, there's there's, there's going to be a lot of chatter, uh, out, you know, out there on those pants and stuff. We attempted uh, to do um, radio transmission last year at Spaceport, but we ended up having it get shut down because we weren't fully prepared for the radio review. That's something we've kept in mind with designing the system this year to make sure that we aren't going to get shut down again. Very good. Very good. Okay, and and, and it's very important that the appropriate people get that information. So, um, I know, right off the top of my head, I don't know exactly who's doing that now, but uh, you know, just make sure you follow up and they get the information ahead of time. Yep. The guys in the okay. tent, the big radio tower. We're going to make yeah. sure we talk to them and that they are very aware of what's happening because when this thing turns on, they're going to know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I yeah. Okay, and I'm not exactly sure how the how the radio or the frequency review is being done. So, um, just be proactive. That, that that I think that's the best thing. I that's the best information I can give you. Yep. On that. So. The only other really okay. thing we cover about the payload is how we're activating it. Um, we have it set up to um, essentially has two modes. It has dormant and active. In dormant, it's basically just waiting to receive a signal to basically turn it on, start the radio transmissions, and also trigger the camera to start recording. Because those are both really power intensive, and we don't know how long we're going to be sitting out in the pad, even with a massive battery like we have, we aren't sure that it will be able to last if we're on the pad for like six hours before we launch. So it won't be. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were on the pad for quite a while last year, so we just want to make sure that we are playing it as safe as possible. Um, okay, but the way it works yeah. is it's armed or it's turned on on the pad with magnetic switches through the carbon fiber. And then it waits for receiving a radio signal telling it, hey, we're good. We're about to launch. This is when you start recording and start transmitting and then it will start talking back to us. We'll see that it will start recording the video to the SD card. And yeah, that's basically the, how the power systems of the payload work. Okay, are you going to basically. Tell the payload to power up and do its thing from the spectator area, or are you going to before you leave the physical pads? What was that? Okay. So yes, it it will be it will be uh we'll send a radio signal from the spectator area, um, telling the payload to begin recording with the camera that's integrated in it. Have you tested that distance out? Um, yes, we have. We've te we've done multiple flight tests of actually less powerful radio transmitters. We did our primary flight test with two watt or two watt radio transmitters, and we had back and forth communication all the way up to I believe twelve thousand feet, and that was the highest we had tested um, in the air. We're doing five watt LORAs, so even more broadcast power, and it'll be able to receive the signal. We are very confident of that. And if it doesn't receive the signal for some reason, then all that happens is the payload sits there in that dormant state and we just don't get any video footage. Okay. Um, when, when you go through the, the radio review, the RF review, point that out that you, you essentially you're activating your payload from the spectator area, which is at least thousand, maybe two thousand feet away. The, the pads and stuff are being rearranged, so you guys need to double check. Um, probably, maybe, maybe the best thing to do is post on Hero X a question saying, "Hey, we're getting ready to do this. Should we anticipate any problems?" Okay. I mean, you know, I, I would hate. I would hate for you to wind up not being able to do it. And right now, I, my gosh, you got to put with a coin chance. Yeah, we also, I forgot to mention this. We do have a redundant activation mechanism. There is an accelerometer on the um, PCB that's controlling the payload that if it doesn't, if it's sitting in the dormant state, it's been turned on with the magnetic switches on the pad. And it doesn't, it hasn't received a radio signal yet, but it's detected. Um, is it detected essentially the G forces of a launch? It will turn on the camera then. Just we won't be getting the nature of our experiment is that we want to be able to have that video footage from right before and as the motor ignites as it starts going up because it's G force dependent. 
if, okay. if for some reason the radio doesn't work, either whether we're not allowed to or it just doesn't receive the signal, we'll just miss out on that first initial impulse, but we'll get the rest of the flight. Okay. So I guess the next obvious question is what happens? You've got your payload sitting there, it's waiting, and we come up and say, take the rocket down because the wind is too high. We're not going to be flying for the rest of the day. Can you go through take down procedure for me? Take down procedure, it'll simply be waving the magnet in front of the magnet switch again. That will cut off the complete power because that's the defining power source is essentially there's the battery, there's the magnet switch, then there's the payload. And all the radio switch okay. and the accelerometer does is tell it to start recording. The magnet switch is like the master switch, so to speak. So we turn that off, the entire thing powers down. Okay, cool. All right, good. Okay. Uh, good luck. <laughs> it's, you. You, you know, my, my, I have two concerns. Right? And, and, and basically just, just follow up with the appropriate people uh, within ESRA and Vinci to make sure they understand what you're doing with your radios, because your five watts is is pretty hefty, and uh, I I would not want us to have to tell you you can't do it, um, you know, uh, when you get there. That that's the last thing I want to happen. Okay, uh, and you'll also have an also. I would strongly suggest that when you when you when the team goes through the the C checks in New Mexico, that you're part of that. Um, yep. So that you can address anything um, there, because there'll probably be a couple of RF guys um, doing an area that we can tap um, just to be on the safe side. Yep. Okay. We can do that. Okay. Um, that's great. I like. I like everything I've seen so far. I like. Okay. I, I don't really have any major problems. Um, it's kind of complex, but that's normal. Um, you know, and you've got some work to do, but that's also pretty normal too. What, where are you with finals? Are you through or finals coming up? <laughs> finals we're, next week. we're, yeah, we're actually in the middle of our prep week right now. Um, oh, I'm gonna start okay. on Monday. Ah, okay. All right. Um, I, I'm good. This was excellent. Okay. Awesome. I, I appreciate everybody being there. I appreciate you being able to show me everything. I probably would feel more comfortable if things were assembled and we were disassembling, but I, I, I think you've got a hand well on the work that needs to be done and you'll, you'll, you'll make the contest. Um, you do have the motor on hand or is it going to be delivered to site? Yep, we have the motor on hand. Um, it is currently with um, our advisor, uh, Bill Dieselin. Um, the director <laughs> of environmental health and safety here at Iowa State. So he has possession of that. Um, he likes to keep a handle on all of the club's energetics. Yep. Yeah, that's not a bad policy. That's yeah. not a bad policy. Um, avoid, okay. avoid mishaps. You've got that one right. Okay. Um, I'm going to flip the table around and let you ask me questions uh, if you have any. Um, about what's coming up, um, I'll make a couple comments, and Bill's probably already passed this down anyway. But you don't have to bring tents, you don't have to bring tables. Uh, we'll provide all that for you on site. So just bring some chairs and you know everything else that you need, but don't worry about tents and tables. Okay. So the, does that mean that the the like whole tent city area from previous years is going to be covered in tents or? Um, are we all going to be crammed into a smaller space? No, we're going to literally, the, the, they're having a professional company come in and install professional tents. Essentially, we're going to tent the parking lot. Wow, that is nice. <laughs> that okay? I'm sure I'm sure a lot of the international teams that aren't able to get tents across the pond really appreciate that. No, no, they 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 buy them at Walmart or whatever. But but you you, you know if you I, I get the question a couple of you've already been there, um, you know, bend is the wind and it's wicked yep. and, and half the tents get destroyed. Yep. Yeah, I think well last year we had a we had a dust devil go straight through the spectator area and just rip apart yep. a bunch of people's tents. So yep, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So we're we're going to solve that problem. Also, we're going to big. 
big speaker system in the middle of the parking lot. Ooh, that so would be nice. Everybody, so everybody can hear um, uh, a lot better than it's been in the past. So it may be may be too loud. <laughs> Yeah. It's easier to um, easier to turn turn speakers down than turn up speakers that aren't there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's just a couple of things that that we're doing to make things better for for the teams um, and Cal the Sun. The other major change, and this this is going to be a fairly major change, and it, that'll be the first time we're using it. The team will, will be issued a a pager. Very similar to the pagers that you get in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. yep. And so when you're, let's say, for instance, we're in New Mexico, okay? You registered, you've got your pager, okay? Um, and, and you're probably going to tell us roughly sometimes, we mm -hmm. will page you to come and bring your rocket for inspection. You don't have to sit in the hallway waiting, you know, for the next next turnaround, Okay. Same thing will be yeah. same same type of of scenarios for at the field also. In other words, when we're ready for you to come up and get your final safety check, you'll get paged. You'll bring your rocket up, okay? So and so on and forth. So does that mean that we have to sign up for like designated time slots beforehand? And what what happens if we were to miss those time slots? Yeah, those are good questions that I don't have answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> which, well, we which I apologize for because that I, you know, I haven't seen all the details on the paging system yet. So um, I don't know how they're going to do that um, in terms of, of, you know, I'm available during these times or whatever, how that's going to work out. So, okay. Okay. I'm sure they'll have some more information once we get a little bit closer. Um, yeah. 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 How about, uh, but, you know, uh, go sorry, continue, Ben. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I know one issue that we did face uh, last spaceport was uh, provided ladders at the launch pads. Um, I believe, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think there was only one ladder provided at the launch pad and it had been moved at one point to a different launch pad. There was one 13 foot ladder. Oh, okay. We needed, be, because our rocket was so tall last year, we needed a 13 foot ladder. Um, and there was one at the uh uh c pads um and that yeah that uh that 13 foot ladder ended up getting moved over to one of the hybrid pads and we ran into some problems with that um so we shouldn't i mean run we have problems with eight foot ladders well, okay i i what i would do is and and don't shoot me but i posted a thing on hero x Yep. That says basically what ladders are going to be available. Um, you know, uh, that's the best I can tell you right now because I honestly don't know how many. Um, you know, we've increased the number of solid pads. Okay. So you know. Yeah. Okay. So are there going the to be um, are there going to be multiple solid pads of like at the launch then, or is it still one just grouped up solids pad? It's going to be there's going to be three groups of ten each or something like that. Okay. Three banks. Okay. Uh, I've heard I've heard numbers like thirty pads something like that. So wow. That that, that may be that, that that may be high, and then there will be the hybrids, and then there will be the multi-age pads too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're looking at. Right now, we're looking at 135. Um, cont and our teams again, um, the. My guess is somewhere around 10 of those will probably drop out. So about the same time as about the same size as last year. Maybe, maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah, and last year was a pretty good turnout as well. Yeah, yeah, and we're, we're going to be opening up earlier. Um, waivers go from sunrise to sunset. So we'll have a little more flexibility in watching. Um, there'll be uh, weather stations out at each of the pad areas. One, th one of the things we found out last year was a 20 mile an hour wind in solids. Doesn't necessarily mean there was a 20 mile an hour wind downrange for the uh, two stage, for instance. So yeah. th that kind of stuff going on. So.
Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have for you. Yep. Okay. Uh, you can kill the you can kill the recording. All right. Okay. And if you like, Ben, um, I mean, since.